Wow, this is a prestigious place. Thank you for the invitation. And we'll do the Sikh greetings. Vaigurji ka khalsa, Vaigurji ki fateh. And good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for uh, coming today. And especially inviting someone like me. Not long ago, about four decades ago, I was in the field in a small village in Punjab, harvesting crops, hand by hand, no machinery. And now here we are, one of the most prestigious uh, places in the world addressing you guys. What we're here today is talk about humanity. I'm not here to tell you how wonderful we are as a community. Just praise ourselves and then you know, go back home. I'm a Sikh. I'm son of, son of an immigrant. My father was a POW in Singapore under the Japanese. My people are a minority within India and globally. We are stateless people. From being stateless, our response to humanitarian disasters is faster than some states. Now, I think the best compliment we ever had was from a minister in Canada. Uh, he met me on one of my tours to Canada and he said, uh, I don't understand, you're a small organization, yet you're one of the first one to respond to disasters around the world, including in India. And that was a very good compliment, not to me, but to our amazing teams around the world and volunteers. Absolutely wonderful. Humanity is above all. As a Sikh, we are told in our prayers, we pray twice a day for Sarabhat Dapala, which means well-being of all. We don't differentiate. That is in every Sikh prayer, daily, minimum twice a day. We pray for the whole humankind, not just ourselves. We do face many challenges, and we face some huge challenges. You know, after 9-11, what happened to the Sikhs, the identity crisis? So many were killed by racists. And then, when we work in places like Iraq, helping the victims of ISIS, remember those victims were running away from people with turbans and beards. That was the identity of the ISIS. And we're Sikhs, we got turbans and beards. So the last eight years, we played a very, very important role in supporting those women that were captured by ISIS. What makes us do what we do? We Sikhs have also had genocides in our history. We are very young faith, youngest in the world probably. We already have three genocides. The most recent was in 1984, which nobody wants to talk about. My opinions, my views as a humanitarian do annoy a lot of people. When you're a humanitarian, you got to challenge human rights abuses for all. As a Sikh and as a minority, the discrimination we faced within India didn't make us hateful. The genocide didn't make us hateful. The continuous persecutions of my people didn't make us hateful because we believe our humanity eventually will win. You've got to remain humane. No matter what we face, Hate can only be defeated, as you heard it so many times, by love. And when I'm working in refugee camps, or even here in the floods in the UK, I don't think people are looking at my face. They're looking at another fellow human being come to help. So my community, although small, is extremely generous. We get so many questions. Who funds Khalsa Aid? We've got chapters in India, Canada, America, Australia, all over the world. We're working all over the world in every emergency where we can, including new operations in Madagascar. My community continues to fund it. Although we suffered, we still see every human being as one, as humanity as one. I think in today's world, that is what's lacking. We don't want to challenge politicians because it might offend someone. We don't want to challenge states because they will ban you or they will put their trolls on you on social media, which we get all the time. As a humanitarian, one thing you have to always be true to yourself. 
you got to speak up. You cannot be bored. So when I hear horrific stories, a powerful state has donated millions toward a humanitarian organization, and that state continues to carry out human rights abuses, and we accept it, there's something wrong. The war in Yemen, when I talk about it, you get pushed down. Our media hardly covers that war because we are supplying weapons to our friends, so-called friends. So humanitarian isn't just about dropping aid. It's talking about what goes on in that field, what goes on in that country, the human rights abuses, as I said, humanitarian. So that's what defines us. As a kid, I grew up in a very small village. I remember the fields burning in the heat and there was no food because the whole harvest burnt in the fields. It didn't rain. I was about nine or 10 years old. And a village priest gathered the whole village, tiny village in the middle of nowhere. This is when there's hardly any electric, there's nothing running, no running water. And he said to everyone, we all going to pitch in together for, till the next crop and we're all going to eat together and help each other. Nobody's going to die. I still remember, remember those words. But as a humanitarian running an organization that keeps growing and growing, somewhere you, you think about where are we going now? Are we, have we become corporate? Have, are we losing our touch? But those little visions of my childhood, what we suffered, I remember the hunger in the village. Being an immigrant doesn't mean I'm going to sit there Say, look, we're going to sit here and just complain about everything. We want to be part of the society. We want to build a society, but we don't want to forget those people that we left behind, which is people in our village, in our state, in our countries. Britain is probably one of the most generous countries in the world on charities. Extremely generous. But unfortunately, recently, somehow, we're going in a different direction when it comes to humanity. We are treating people as commodities. We're treating people worse than, I think, animals at the moment when they come to our country. Migrants, I am a migrant. I am son of a migrant. I want to better my life. I want to better someone else's life in my family. So we must reflect how the world's changing. So as I said, what we suffered as a community as Sikhs has made us stronger. It's made us more human. The concept of langar in the community, in the Sikh community, which is a free community kitchen, feeds thousands of people across India every day and around the world. And that's what we take them to refugee camps. Nobody goes hungry where we're working. So for a Sikh organization to be involved so heavily globally, that for me, shows that my community, in all this time of darkness, continues to shine as humanitarians. Today, I can say the refugees on the Syrian Iraq border need two million pounds worth of food. And I can guarantee you, my community will raise that within minutes. And that's what makes me proud as a Sikh. We, will, we are known, Sikhs are known. If you look at both of world wars, World War I, World War II, our Sikh soldiers fought all over the world, from Middle East, Far East, Asia, Europe. They were poisoned, they died in the trenches, died in the heat in the Middle East, in World War I, World War II. We were very visible. We became like the UN. Our identity is automatic. We got the identity already, the turban, the beard. So we are fighting two, on two fronts. One is to take on people like the organizations and groups with the ideologies like ISIS who got the turban and beard. And then we got our own demons. Now can, we, can we do more? Can we do much more for, for, the, for the world? And each day and every day, you're seeing suffering. Just because the world's changed doesn't mean we change. If we really want to make the change, You've got to resist this, what's going on. And the way to resist it is through your humanity. So I might be a Sikh, a human being first. My faith has helped me immensely. It gave me the strength 
but each faith does that. We got people who are atheists who volunteer with us. We got all sorts of faith that come volunteer with us. Because what I wanted to do as a CEO wasn't just sit on a high chair somewhere and dictate. I get my hands dirty. Every CEO in any charitable organization should spend a few weeks on the ground getting their hands dirty. Unfortunately, most CEOs are bought from business sector because the turnover is so big. They never known or never know what the person on the in the field is going through, what they need to do, how they struggle every day, what they face, the challenges. We need to change that culture. We're here as part of you. If there's anything that we can do together, we will do it. If there's any way we can go and do a project together, we welcome that. I remember as a kid, I wanted to volunteer for bigger organizations. And all they kept telling me, telling me was, uh, donate the money, donate the money, give us the money. I wanted to be on the field. So we give you that choice. You want to see what we do, come with us. That's the difference between us and the big organizations. We want you to experience what it's like on the forefront. My son, he went on the first mission, he's 22. He went on the first mission this year in Madagascar. You know, he's grown up here, had everything, and then he saw the reality. It really hit him hard. And for once, he was questioning which way we're going as human beings. We have so much here, not enough there. So the world is a very uneven, very unfair, and mostly a very, very fastly changing place where now we got people leaving their countries, the lack of water, environmental changes, and somehow we have to change with that. So we are growing with your support, but we still got to keep in touch who we are. Our humanity must always come first. My biggest fear is when people make large donations to us, like J.K. Rowling, she done a huge donation to Carl Said, but to make sure we spend it. There's so much to do, but we can do it together. But mostly, whenever we see something wrong, we need to open our mouths. It doesn't matter who we upset. Politically, you'll always upset someone. And that's one thing that you, nobody can take away from you, is your own voice. So now we'll do a Q&A, is it? Thank you. Thank you. And just for clarity of the audience, I will be referring to Mr. Ravi Singh as Uncle G, as a sign of respect um, for sick elderly male figures. Uncle G, you founded an organization named Khalsa Aid, with the tagline recognizing Human Race as One, as you mentioned. What does Khalsa mean to someone who's never heard the word Khalsa before? Basically, it's a um, term for, some people say brotherhood, but it's more of a concept of philosophy of someone who's a saint soldier. You can see the saint a mile away. When it needs to be done, something needs to be done. When it needs to be a soldier, he'll defend humanity too. We also have the phrase deg deg fateh. Deg, 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 for means that we will serve food, we'll serve humanity, but we'll also defend that humanity with the sword. So Khalsa is part of that philosophy that, you know, we will always challenge the darkness. Hmm. What would you say to someone who thinks they know a lot about Khalsa or thinks that they've, they know about you? What is some fun fact about Khalsa and fun fact about you that they wouldn't have expected? Fun fact, uh, we, hold, we held a record for the most skydives, tandem skydives. We held it for like two months till somebody in America broke it. We were quite unhappy about that. We thought it might be here forever. <laughs> so that was about 10 years ago. We had, uh, I think, 131 jumps in one day. So yeah, uh, the other fun fact is uh, I like zombie movies. I think that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> In providing aid, especially in wartime and conflict areas, as you mentioned, how do you handle bias, uh, especially being a person with opinions and belief on, on what is right and what is wrong, but then also leading an organization that is aimed at seeing people's humanity before anything else? How do you handle that? Well, we don't really see any people's faiths or, or cultures or whatever. We just go and get help people, human beings. Uh, it's a great way of learning about people. I always tell people that if you're in 
like in uh, 2014 when ISIS was rising in uh, Iraq, we had um, we learned about the Yazidi people and the Assyrian Christian people. We didn't know who they were, minorities in Iraq, which is quite shameful for us. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so we don't really have any bias. We see people, anyone, it doesn't matter what background they are, as long as they need help, we get stuck in. And it's, and it's great because all our volunteers share that. All our volunteers share the same thing. So, you know, that's one thing when they say, what do I need to volunteer? So you need to make sure that you don't have any prejudice towards anyone. Mm. You can't, not if you say you recognize the human race as one, then you can't pick and choose. That's really beautiful. And I know so much of that stems from concepts of Sikhi um, in Sarbat Tapala and Chardikala. So Sikhi obviously has a focus also on forge and bravery. Um, and, you know, in, in the history of Sikhism, there's a long history of battles and um, fighting for its right, whether it's for free speech or for freedom of religion, um, of other faiths as well. How do you reconcile Sikh history uh, with battles and your work, which also aims to heal people from battles and wartime? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, our history inspires us. Our history, history shaped us who we are. Uh, the Sikh history, like I said, is very young. We're only a few hundred years old. But our history is very rich. Uh, it's full of sacrifice, uh, and we are here because of those sacrifices. Mm. It could be sacrifices in the 1700s, 1500s, it could be 1980s. You know, those sacrifices of, uh, as we call our martyrs, the shades, they put us where we are today. So they make us fearless. What they went through, uh, for instance, when we had uh, uh, gold coins on our heads by the Mughals, and uh, Every, every Sikh head was rewarded by a gold coin and we still didn't give up the faith and we still survived in the jungles. So yeah, our history is, is our main inspiration. Uncle G, what would you say is the biggest mistake you've made throughout your leadership journey? Mm, I'm perfect, so I don't really make mistakes. <laughs> My wife says, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, no uh, it's not really mistakes you you learn a lot biggest thing would be failure the biggest thing when i got on a plane is am, are we going to fail to do a mission mm. launch a mission when we go on a mission so mistakes are made every day we're human beings mistakes are probably countless mistakes but well, hopefully we learn from them but the main thing is the mm. biggest fear is always the failure that if we go in an organization if we go in a disaster the people, the supporters, they expect us to launch an operation ASAP. So you have to make sure that you, you know, live up to that expectation. Mm. I think something that definitely brought a lot of notoriety, especially to Khal Saeed and to yourself as a public figure and a humanitarian, was the farmers' protest in 2020. You led Khalsa Aid to humanitarian intervention across India for farmers across who were affected by the bills imposed by the Indian government. As someone who created a fundraiser for Khalsa Aid myself, I remember the targeted messages I had received. But I still wonder, and my question for you is, how did you, at a large scale, and the leader of this organization, navigate targeted, hateful, um, and incorrect messages? I mean, uh We've, uh, we've got Amr Amrapreet Singh, who's the India head, who's with us today, thankfully, on the front row. Um, and many of the trustees and individuals and ourselves were targeted by the Indian intelligence agencies, uh, put fake, fake cases on us. Uh, we've had trolls. But then in 2017, when we helped the Rohingya refugees, and because they were Muslim, we had the far-right groups in India, absolute vile, vile tweets and social media attacks on Khal Saeed. Why are you helping them? They're snakes, they're terrorists, Sikh terrorists, helping Muslim terrorists. We had all these labels. So the trolls are out there. You know, we do get trolled a lot, especially from the right-wing groups. But it's not something that really, to be honest, puts us off. That motivates us more. So if you say what motivates us, like I said, hate, you can turn hate into love and you can hate it into humor. I like to humor people. Uh, wind them up a little bit. I don't take anything personally now because it's mostly trolls. So yeah, it's uh, you. You know, once you go take part in the farmers' protest, you're going against the government. You're going against government. One of the one of the probably most uh, uh, propaganda 
expert in his field, the Indian government. They went after us. Even now, you know, we get targeted because of that, because he stood by the farmers. Mm -hmm. It's not like we stood against an enemy country. Farmers are Indian citizens. Mm -hmm. Our volunteers are Indian citizens. We're buying everything locally, supplying locally. They still turn against us. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a bit strange, but we will always stand, always stand against four people who are struggling against injustice. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how big the government or how much they come after you, we have to speak up. Uncle G, similar, similar topic. There are many moments in Sikh history that were particularly defining moments. Moments that we can refer back on, just off the top of my head, you know, affecting the Sikh community may include the 1984 Sikh genocide. Um, how would you say that Sikh leaders, for example, Jarniel Singh Bindarwale and many other Shaheeds and martyrs, as well as the Khalistani movement, have helped shape your leadership and your ways of approaching your work today? 1980s was a time when a lot of young Sikh men were targeted by the Indian state, purely because the movement grew at such a pace they couldn't defeat it. So the best way was to target certain age groups, young, young men in rural areas who were joining the movement. One of them was my friend or my brother, you call, we grew up together in Punjab in a village. And uh, it was his murder by the Indian state that brought me this way. He was tortured in five different police stations in 1989, Charnji Singh Chani. We grew up together, I was in the UK, I, I lost touch with him. Only by chance I saw what happened to him in mid 90s, I, that I found out that he was killed in 89. The way he was tortured, I found everyone from the families, from the friends from my mother, he was tortured so severely. And then there was a fake encounter where what the police do, they beat you up enough that almost every bone's broken. And then they uh, basically stick a rifle or assault rifle in your hands mm. and they shoot you, take a picture. And that was, became a very common theme. So all the young guys who stood up against the state, for me, they're heroes. I'll never turn against my own. So I'm now saying Pindravali knew there were tens of thousands of soldiers coming in and the 200 things with him that took the stand will forever be heroes of people like myself. It doesn't matter what people define me, we will always stand by them. Thank you for sharing. I, as a Sikh myself, I think we often look back at our history and we pull so much courage for maintaining our Sikhi and continuing to fight for Sikh rights um, because of the deep history that we have and the many Shaheeds in our history. Many, many Sikhs also inquire from a leader like yourself, how do they continue to fight against discrimination, um, challenges that they might be facing in school from a very young age with their turbans or patkas or beards and then also later on in their life as they navigate identifying as a Sikh in a public manner to a world that might not know about Sikhi. I mean, we're really in a good place at the moment that there are so many Sikh organizations in, in the West, especially America, Canada, UK, so many civil rights organizations now, amazing amount. You know, CELDA, Sikh Coalition, all these organizations in, in North America, WSO, amazing organizations. These are the, you know, organizations that have been there for a long time. They fight these cases, discrimination, uh, civil rights, and et cetera. So um, I think best thing is to get to know what your organizations are doing. Unfortunately, we don't. Number one, we don't support the organizations until we need them or we don't want to know about them. So the best way to tackle discrimination is education. Teach yourself about the organization, what they offer. Mm -hmm. And then maybe a lot of the parents, especially in school where there's one or two operating children like long hair, they, they form a little group. And then they, sometimes they approach us for issues then I would pass that case on to people in the community that we know. We're not experts in that civil rights, but we do know people who are. Mm -hmm. So it's important that people reach out. It's if they want to reach out to us, wherever we are, our chapters are, we'll be happy to receive that in India, Canada, uh, UK, USA, wherever, Australia, we will help. Mm -hmm. We'll put you in the, on, onto the right path to the right organization. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the other question that we missed out, I missed out that you asked before, was the question of Khalistan. Mm -hmm when you asked earlier, uh, everyone has the right to self-determination. Everyone has the right to seek that, everyone. 
even in the Indian Constitution, uh, Indian High Court had ruled the Supreme Court that it's not a criminal offence to, to fight for the ideology of Khalistan. So most of the people that gave their lives for Khalistan in the 80s, they did so not for greed or power or personal money or whatever. They did it for the ideology. And the way the state is going at the moment, Indian state, I think they've got bigger problems than Khalistan. The way they're going through this hate, right wing hate, we need to reflect on that. All the good Indians, they need to really speak up against this at the moment, the current mm. wave of hate that's going on. Mm. And to do that, people have to speak up. And I think they will create more than Khalistan if they don't stop this hate. I think that leads right into this next question, probably in terms of speaking up and using our voice. We're at a place like the Oxford Union, a place of free thought and free expression, and that's the history of the legacy of this kind of an institution. What advice would you give to students at the Oxford Union, at the university, and then also six students in terms of speaking up, especially amidst controversy and difficulties? I think like we live in these times now, we see people drowning at sea. People People drowning at sea. What annoys me most isn't the fact that far right groups are rejoicing when they drown, mm. the migrants. What really annoys me is when I hear uh, Asians, especially Sikhs, suddenly become experts on migration and join these right wing groups. We are countries full, we don't need it. Well, hang on, our fathers, our forefathers struggled. Like my father was a POW, he worked for the British in the, in the Royal Navy uh, as a fireman, mm. and he was a POW. We didn't come here through like charitable handouts. Our people, the Sikhs, have spilled their blood all over the world in both wars, and even now continues on UN missions around the world. So you've mm. got to speak up. You've got to speak up. If, if a boat has sunk with 20 people on board, they're human beings. They're like you and me. They're like our forefathers who went for a better life. And so what? People say it's a migrant, economic migrant, so what? We're all here because of that. We all want to be better our lives. So we got to reflect who we are. If you're a Sikh especially, and I, you know, I say it as it is, if it offends people, it offends people. I think Preeti Patel played a very good card recently. She put that Sikh judge in the front to make the judgment against those guy going to Rwanda. I disagree with it. I would resign if I was a judge. There's certain things you've got to look back in life saying, is that a job? Do I have to do that job? You guys are blessed. You're in one of the best institutions in the world. You're making great networks. You've got absolutely wonderful friends. Use that network to raise your voices. Go out there and make that change. Come with us if you want to see some of the world, what we do. Give us two weeks of your life. Go on a mission. The world is full of good people. Generally, the people are good. If I say to someone, we're going to go to Iraq, first thing, like, oh my God, you're going to go to Iraq. What do you think? People are just queuing up just to kill us over there? People are normal. Everyone just wants to get on with their lives. Don't believe the media. The media makes it so difficult for people living in this country. First, we devastate the countries. And then we put people off traveling there with propaganda. So what's the word Sikh mean? Sikh mean learn. So learn. You learn. And then you pass it on. Don't believe what's written in the papers or online. Discover it. Guru Nanak Dev, you're our first guru. We travel the world. There was no planes then. What's stopping you guys? So that's what I said. That's my message to you guys. It's a beautiful place. And the healing can only begin with you guys. And that means everyone speaks up when you see something wrong. You, you know, you might not get your votes later on if you send as an MP saying, oh, this guy said it against this. But what's your principle? There's no principles anymore. So many times we've been asked to sell our principles. I remember an uh, invitation to meet the uh, Indian Prime Minister once when he was visiting. What for? I don't agree with the ideology. Just to say a handshake, take a picture. So look, I met him. You have to have some sort of principles, especially on human rights. Our guru, ninth guru, 
he gave his life defending a different faith mm -hmm. because he believed everybody has right to believe whatever they want to believe. Could be a Muslim, could be a Hindu, could be a Christian. This world doesn't need this hate. It needs tolerance, acceptance, reaching out to your neighbor. Even in Christian Bible, it said, love thy neighbor. Our neighbors are the world. We live in a small world. So, you know, that's what your responsibilities are. Thank you for that, Uncle G. Many people would say that so much of Khal Saeed already fills something that Sikhi has a healing power of in the world. What do you think is the future of Khal Saeed? Are there other medicines that Khal Saeed can provide in terms of this worldly matter? Like I said, the concert of Langar Community Kitchen is one of the most powerful. Deg, Teg, Fateh. We got the Deg, we got the Teg. We, we have to respect both. In a world where we're becoming fast becoming leaders in arms exports, unfortunately, UK is one of those. When Sikh says, Deg, Deg, Fateh, it rings alarm bells. Why? We can sell weapons all around the world, but if a Sikh says, Deg, Deg, Fateh, it's a problem. So the future for us, I think, to build a better world, Langar is a beautiful concept. We can feed the world. Mm. You know, in the Sikhi, they say, Sava luck that a Sikh can fight 125,000. It's, it's the spirit of that fight, isn't it? Mm. That we can then feed 125,000 to. In this world where there's sort of food shortages, Langar could be a great answer to it. So yeah, we can, we can change it. We can heal it. I think that's beautiful. And we're gonna have one more quick question here, then we're gonna open it up to audience questions. We'll probably have one or two. Um, so the last question is for you, Uncle G, what does seva mean to you? Seva meaning selfless service in the Sikh philosophy. What does it mean to you? Well, I remember doing seva in the Gurdwara when I was young, putting, you know, serving water to the people, eating langar in the Gurdwara and cleaning up after when I was a kid. So now I'm, I'm more like facilitator mm -hmm. of seva. I don't really do say what you could say. I'm a facilitator, so we give an opportunity to anybody who wants to save the service, selfless service around the world, in a refugee camp, to serving the homeless in the UK, where we've got a great team, Langer 18. So I've become a facilitator. Seva is an amazing concept. It's, it's a concept I don't think is known in, or, or is anywhere in other faiths, mm -hmm. that selfless service that we serve others of ourselves. Yeah. And that's taught from our, also from our Gurbani and our Punjabi roots. You go to any Punjabi household, could be in Pakistan, could be in India, wherever there's Punjabis, you won't go hungry. Mm. We insist you eat, we'll give you shelter, we'll give you food, you know, we'll protect you. That's what we are. And that's automatic, it's instilled in us when we help abroad. We don't need to fake anything, we don't need to create a personality. That personality was being created through Gurbani and our culture. That Punjabis are most generous people. So seva is an amazing concept. And that's what's changing a lot of the world here. So many homeless groups now. So many Sikh homeless groups. It's amazing. We will now turn to audience questions. So if you can just raise your hand if you would like to ask a question to Ravi Uncle. Right here, um, the woman in the black, please. Rise. Oh, you can sit down. Sorry. Can I sit down? Oh, have you sit down? Thank you. Yeah. Why Krishika Khalsa? Why Krishiki Fateh? Um, as both being an ambitious woman who wants a career and then also has expectations of marriage and wants to start a family as well, how do you balance your family life, your private life versus the public life, the traveling, the helping the entire human world? How do you create that balance? Well, my wife's right next to you. So uh, she finds the balance. So uh, even like packing the stuff like last minute traveling, it's like suddenly like uh, she knows the different color turbans I need in the suitcase as well. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's uh, when the kids are younger, it's very difficult. Mm. It's been a struggle when they were younger, like they always struggle when they're young, because you're balancing, it's not easy. So uh, you need to have someone support you, like my missus there. Uh, with the kids, it's, as they've grown up, it makes it easier. But when they're young kids, it's, 
it's extremely difficult because you both got to balance. Uh, you know, nowadays cost of living is quite high. Both need to work. So unless you're like um, have that real zeal to to be involved, it's a lot of sacrifices, especially for the kids. Because you go away so much. Next thing you know, they're grown up. And you look back and think, whoa, where did that time go? You know, you just, kid was only born the other day, now he's like 21, 22, whatever. So, and you spend most of your time on travels. So now, in the last couple of years, I spent home because I'm waiting for a transplant, a kidney transplant. But other than that, I was always out. So it is, it is something you look back, you think, well, you know, I missed so much, kids growing up. Not easy. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Chair recognizes the woman in the second row in the black. Thank you so much, Uncle G. Um, as Casa Aid goes into new geographies and as conflict continues to arise in different parts of the world, what ambitions and hopes do you have for Casa Aid in the next five to ten years? I think ambition, uh, when people, some, some of the people ask me what's the biggest achievement, my biggest achievement is that we have a whole generation of young Sikhs who have become humanitarian following the work of Carl Said. And that still remains the same goal. It's not about money, it's not about fame, it's about molding that generation, continue to mold a young generation into humanitarians. So, um, especially when we face such changes, political changes around the world, this is more important. So we need to inspire people to be humanitarians. If it was about money, then I suppose I wouldn't be doing half the stuff. When you chase money, you're never really happy, you're never really content, we're quite content. And the next goal is to get you guys involved in Carl Said, create that next generation, next wave of humanitarians. And we do need those. Hmm. We've got one more question. Do we have a sing maybe in the audience? I'd like to, the chair recognizes in the purple. Um, so I follow you on Twitter and I, I find it really inspirational, the strength that you show to continue undeterred despite all the trolls and the you know, hate you get online. Um, but I also noticed that you get a lot of um, <coughs> doubters from within the Sikh community, um, people saying that, you know, why are you spending resources that could be uh, spent in Punjab or, um, you know, the causes, uh, the things that are necessary there. So how do you answer to those critics? Yeah, we've, uh, we've got two types of trolls. One is the far-right Indian trolls. And then you got the um, trolls within the community who will never promote your work. So if you look at some of their tweets and you go back to social media, they will never tweet or retweet or share Carl side work. And we're doing so much in Punjab. And we got the Amarpreet here from Punjab. You know, amount of work that's Carl side doing is probably unmatched by other organizations from abroad in Punjab. And we ask people to come and have a look and report it yourselves. So yeah, there's always more we can do, and we're always planning to do more. But Punjab is a place which is difficult to work in. Uh, as I said, those people will never share our work. So we have to expect there will be some sort of um, resistance in some quarters or from established organizations to feel threatened by the rise of Carl Said. But we are always open. If there's any reg registered organization in Punjab want to work with us, we always welcome it. I've been writing about it. Let's work together. Tell us what you want to do, give us a plan, give us a proposal, and we'll look into it. Unfortunately, we'll never get rid of the trolls. But uh, I know for a fact that our work remains unmatched. And I hope one day when you go to Punjab, you can spend time with Amarpreet and have a look. Uh, the hardships they face working in the field is a difficult place to work. A lot of government restrictions as well. Service. You're, doing a, you're doing a wonderful job. Ravi Uncle, I have grown up being inspired by you, hearing about you, watching your stories, and for me it's an immense honor to sit here with you today creating this moment in history at the Oxford Union and at Oxford University. So thank you immensely for being here. Thank you very much. I know this is something that eight-year-old eight -year Serene would be very shocked by because I know 25-year-old Serene is shocked by it. but. To sit here with everyone in the Sangha, also in attendance, um, 
hearing your story and your journey and also the vision for the future is deeply powerful. So thank you for thank making you the trek much. over to Oxford, um, for serving this world in so many ways, and then for allowing us to also be served um, by your wisdom and your knowledge. Thank Please you. help me in thanking Mr. Ravi Singh for thank being here. Much.